So your name and how do you spell it? My name is Leo Dean Hymas, L-E-O D-E-A-N-H-Y-M-A-S. Okay, just in case we lose the tape here. Um, uh, start with, and uh, were you from Washington State originally? No, I was born in southern Idaho in the Bear Lake Valley. When I was 12 years old, my parents moved to Cache Valley, a town near Smithfield, to work on a farm. My father owned a 365-acre dairy farm. So I worked milking cows and feeding calves and hauling hay and thinning beets and harvesting grain, and all the things that farm kids do. And you were going to school, a small one-room school? I was going, well, no, it was a little bigger than that. I went to a, a summit school in Smithfield and then to junior high school in Smithfield and then to North Cache High School. And that would have been in the 1940s. I remember Pearl Harbor Day. It was a Sunday. We were coming out from church and my father turned the radio on in the car and we learned that Pearl Harbor had been attacked and we were at war. I was 15 years old and I remember thinking, where is Pearl Harbor? And my father explained and it was so far away it didn't have much meaning so I didn't really understand much about the fact that we were at war. But uh, some of the young men as they graduated were drafted into the military and some left to join the Air Force or the Navy or the Marines. And you know they came back with some of the nicest looking uniforms, especially those Marines. And I thought, wow, if that happens to me, I'll get a date with a real pretty girl because they were all going for these wonderful, good looking uniforms. I really thought that would happen. Things were rationed in those days because the war effort required most of the gasoline. We had an A card, it gave you eight gallons of gas per week. Uh, we had an old 41 Chevrolet, you couldn't go very far with that much gas. But we had a separate account for our tractor so we could do our farm work. Meat was rationed, but that didn't really affect us too much because we raised our own beef. And shoe leather was rationed. You got three pairs of shoes in one year. Sugar was rationed. And you had little uh, ration slips that you went to the grocery with to, to buy your, your goods. And we all had to register for the draft when we were 18 years old. And we did that, of course. And I was in, the, I was in senior year in high school. My birthday was in February. And I registered, and uh, two weeks before I graduated from high school, and this would have been one month before D-Day, so the war had been going on for quite a while. We knew that uh, there was a bad guy over in Europe, and his name was Hitler. And we knew there was a bad guy in Japan, and his name was Hirohito. And we made fun of them and laughed about it. And, down in our little town, there was a big poster with all the names of the young men who had gone off to war. And we would go down there and say, well, I knew him, and maybe he'll be back. And, and then my mother told me about these little flags that were hanging in everybody's window. It was a serviceman's flag, white with a blue star, red around it. I said to mom, what is that? She said, well, it means that someone from that house has gone to serve in the military. I can remember seeing some with two flags, sometimes two stars. And I, I thought, well, oh, that's, that's really interesting. One day there was one with a gold star, and I asked mom, what did that mean? She said, well, their boy's not coming back. Thus a gold star mother. I didn't fully understand all of that. One day a knock came on the door and I went to the door and there was a man delivering a telegram addressed to me. I'd never received a telegram in my life before. And my folks standing around, stood around as I opened it and it said, greetings. You are hereby directed to report to Fort Douglas, Salt Lake City, Utah for induction into the United States Army. 
and it was signed by the President of the United States, Franklin D. Roosevelt. Now I know now that he didn't really sign that. We had a draft board in our little town, and they had these forms, and it was their job to select those who were to be drafted and send this form to tell you you were going to be inducted, and that's what happened. That's how, I, how it came to be that I was inducted into the Army. So the day came. Do you remember what your mom its reaction was to that telegram coming to your house? Yes, she shed a few tears. And my dad looked at me very soberly, and they looked at the date when I was to go, and it was after graduation of high school. And there were several of us from that graduating class. My dear friend, uh, Ken Weiser, uh, and I were received telegrams for the same day. So the day came when uh, my mom and my dad and my younger brother and my younger sister came to the train station to say goodbye. I wanted to take my dog and my pony, but that wasn't allowed. And uh, my dad, uh, you know how dads are. He put his arm around my shoulder and, son, remember who you are. My mother she cried a little bit. My sister cried a little bit. And my brother, who was two years younger than me, blubbered. And I said goodbye, and I got on the train and went to Salt Lake City to Fort Douglas. And they took away all my civilian clothes and gave me a, a new uniform. And I thought, this isn't a very pretty uniform. I won't gain dates with this. It was the OD and the fatigues that they give you. And they put us on a train and sent us to a far off place near Dallas, Camp Walters, Texas, located next to a little town of Mineral Wells, Texas. And I was in a training group to learn to be a soldier for 17 weeks hmm. with all those guys I'd never met before living in this big barracks. And we had the meanest, rottenest old sergeant. He cussed us and yelled at us and made us stand at attention in the hot sun. He made us uh, run everywhere we went. And uh, we had to hike with full field packs. And he was a mean, old, tough guy. And I thought, how can I stand all this? And I got so homesick. I missed my mom and my dad and my sister and my brother and my dog and my pony, and I wanted to go home. And I was stuck there for 17 weeks. And Have then, you ever been out of Utah? Never before? been out of the little valley I lived in. Did you know when you were in training there for 17 weeks, did you, were you always on base or did you get? I got one or two. Uh, passes to go into town. and uh, Was well, there segregation in that part of Texas too? We had no, we had no uh, black soldiers in my training division. There were a few in town, civilians, families, and that sort of thing. What I remember about that one pass was I had to learn to swim side strokes so I could carry my pack and my rifle out of the water, and I couldn't, I didn't know how to do that. And I couldn't get a pass till I learned how. So when everybody was going to town on pass, I was learning how to swim out in the swimming hole. Near the end of our training, they took us in what we call Hell's Bottom. And we learned house-to-house -house combat. And uh, all we learned uh, how to use the bayonet. And we learned hand-to-hand -hand fighting. And it was very realistic because they... They had props of, of men who had fake wounds lying around, indicating this was my, what might happen to you. Now, I didn't know at the time, but those young men who were not yet 18 years old were not uh, permitted to go overseas, although they had been sending them. There was some responsive feedback about that. So the president directed that 18-year-olds would not be sent overseas until they were 19. I wasn't quite 19. So they sent me to Camp, to camp uh, Maxi at Texarkana for an additional advanced infantry training. And then they sent me to Camp Gruber, Oklahoma for more additional advanced infantry training. Then I got a short leave at home, 10 days. And you know, I didn't get a single date with a pretty girl. 
and I was ordered back to Camp Cook, California, which is now Vandenberg Air Force Base. It was right on the water near Santa Maria. And I was assigned to the 97th Infantry Division, which was training as an amphibious division to go overseas and bring Douglas MacArthur back from, from Australia, where he'd gone after the fall of the Philippines. But I was only there just a short time, and what I know now is the Battle of the Bulge took place in Europe. All we knew then was the sergeant said, turn in your summer uniforms, take the winter uniforms we're going to give you, and go get on that train. Where are we going? They never told us. So as the train headed eastward, we'd look out the windows and we'd ask the people when it stopped, where is this? And it was someplace in Colorado or Arizona or maybe Nebraska or Ohio or Pennsylvania. We finally ended up at Camp Kilmer, New Jersey. And it takes quite a while, I guess, to get a whole division together. And so I got a one day pass to go to the big city of New York. And I got there and I saw those people and all that traffic and it scared me. I'd never been in a big city with all those tall buildings before. I found the stage door canteen, which is a place where you can write letters to home and there's a library where you can ma read magazines and newspapers. And very highly chaperoned young girls would come and dance with us to music they played on a record. And there were nice ladies who served cookies and milk and whatever. And so I was dancing with this young girl and she said, well, where are you stationed? I said, well, I'm sorry, I can't tell you. It's a military secret. She said, oh, I know. You're at Camp Kilmer and you're going overseas very soon. She was right. They loaded us in a truck, went down to this great big ship. I'd never seen a ship before, but there it was, tied to the dock. And uh, there was a gangway to go up. And they had these uh, steel bunks with rope lacing canvas on the ship. It was a former cruise ship converted to a troop carrier with bunks clear to the overhead. In every compartment, there were 3,500 bunks on that ship, but they loaded 7,000 of us aboard, two to a bunk, and we set sail that night. Well, in the North Atlantic in 1944, the uh, waves were huge. That old ship just went this way and then it went that way and I think everyone on that ship got seasick. They gave us only two meals a day. They started feeding at five o'clock in the morning. That was breakfast or brunch. Twelve noon was lunch or dinner. Five o'clock, ten o'clock at night they quit. And everybody was seasick. You know what happens when you get seasick. You up chuck, and everybody did. And the vomit down in the lower companionways was up to your ankles, and the smell was horrible. So I put on my sweater and my jacket and my cap, and I took my little book of scriptures, and I went up on the deck, tried to find a place out of the wind where it would be a little warmer, and I looked, and we were in a, a double row of ships in a large convoy that stretched from horizon to horizon, and there wasn't a light shown any place. The portholes were all covered. The hatches were all covered. We were in submarine territory, and I thought, where am I going? What's going to happen to me? I don't want to do this. Will I ever see my family, my home again? I'm only 18 years old. I'm just a kid. I don't want to do this. I would have been 19 when we got there, probably. That's how they worked it. I started to cry. And I thought my mother had taught me to pray. And I did it on that ship. I prayed. And I thought, that mean old rotten sergeant made me into a soldier. I'm an American soldier. If I do what he taught me to do, I'm going to be okay. And I made up my mind I would be the best soldier I could be. That I would follow all the rules and the regulations. And I would do my best to serve my country honorably. 
And I made up my mind I would never be taken prisoner because I knew we were going into the combat zone. We landed after about eight days at La Havre, France. And we were loaded into trucks and moved to a large tent camp called Lucky Strike after the name of a cigarette that was popular in those days. It was raining and wet and muddy and cold. And I can recall thinking, this isn't what I thought war would be like. But we weren't at the front. France had just barely been liberated. Belgium, Holland had barely been liberated. And the front line was right down the Rhine River. The Battle of the Bulge, which we'd headed for to help out, was already over with. So they loaded us into railroad cars, just like the ones that were the Jews were shipped to the camps in, although I knew nothing about that. They didn't put us in like two or three hundred of us and lock and nail the doors shut. There were only about 10 or 12 in each car. And I understand they used the car, the trains to ship us because the bridges were all out and bombed and the rails were still operating. So we went along in this train going through Holland. And I knew nothing about anybody like Anne Frank and the train was going kind of slow and it stopped and I was sitting in the open doorway with my feet hanging out and a little girl came out to the train and I looked at that little girl. She was maybe eight or 10 years old. She had on a little pink dress, no coat or no hat. Her arms were so skinny and tiny and her legs looked like little broomsticks and she had her feet wrapped in some kind of rags and she held up a little piece of money. And she, I looked down at that sunken little face. I'll never forget that little girl's face. That's the first time in my life I'd ever seen a starving person. She held up a little piece of money and she said in English, chocolate. I had a piece of candy in my pocket from my ration and I handed it to her and she gave me that piece of money. It's a one guilder note. It's worthless today, but to me it's priceless because I'll never forget the face of that little girl. She went a little few steps and looked at the candy and then she turned and waved to me and I waved to her and I resolved once again to do my best to overcome whatever horrible force had caused that debilitating effect on that sweet little girl. I've never seen her since. I don't know who she was or anything about it. I surely hope she survived. The train arrived and we unloaded and we took up positions on the west side of the bank of the Rhine River at Remagen. There had been a steel railroad bridge across there and we had gotten a few men across and then the bridge was finally blown up. And one day they said, we attack at five o'clock tonight. Back at Camp Kilmer, I'd met a dear friend. His name was Jimmy DeMarco. He came from Boston. He and I were assigned to be machine gunners. Heavy 30 caliber, call, uh, heavy 30 caliber, water-cooled machine gun. I was the gunner. He was assistant gunner. I didn't like him when I first met him. He talked funny. He would say things like about Pac and his car and his garage and brushing his teeth with a toothbrush and taking a bath in a bath pub. I thought he was putting on airs. Well, he didn't like me either because where I came from, we would say things like, putting our horses in a barn and feeding them corn. See, he was a city kid, and I was a country bumpkin. But we became fast friends, and we decided we would be the best machine gun operators there were. We could take that thing apart and put a new barrel in it, and we could hit the target, and we were a fine, he was my best friend. We loved each other, just my age. 
Was so, that um, um, the first? Uh, when you got to the front, was that where they, where you first were disembarked from the train was Vermagen? No, it was at uh, Cologne. So you actually had... We, we hiked, or we went by truck down to Vermagen. And the, that, was the, that was the line then? At the there, there, was a, uh, there was a unit there on position and we replaced them one night. So we they were, were just they were holding? Pull, they were pulled back for rest and rehabilitation. We took their place. I put the machine gun in the tripod marks that they had had their machine gun in and it, it faced out over the Rhine River. So when you were going from Cologne to Remagen on a truck, you were going forward towards the line. Did you see vehicles coming back from the line? A few, not too many. Was it just troops coming back or? There was no fighting. There was no shells that I could see. There, We just set up a, a position that was called quiet. And it was quiet on the other side of the river. And the Germans were on the other side. They were on the other side. When the order came to attack, we were, we, uh, a machine gun squad in those days was 14 people, two machine gunners, and the rest carried these little green cans that had the ammunition in it. And we had a Jeep and a Jeep driver. So when the order came to attack, the engineers had built a floating bridge across the river, and the trucks and the tanks and the half tracks and the Jeep with me in it, with the machine gun sitting on the dashboard, I sat in the front seat beside the driver. We went across. And then we had to jump out and take cover along a, it was kind of a hillside. And then the shells began to come. And if I could hear the mortars dropping and the artillery, and I could hear the men scream with pain and call for the, <coughs> for the medics. And it's gonna, there's gonna be an order for us to go over the top. I know it's coming. And when it does, I hesitated. But my best friend, Jimmy DeMarco, did not. He was killed at that moment with a 20 millimeter anti-aircraft shell. The Germans were, had depressed their anti-aircraft guns and were using them against ground troops. I lost my best friend that first night. I was so angry, so sorrowful, so afraid, so frightened, all those feelings. I can hardly remember what I did after that. I must have reacted as a soldier would because I remember attacking a large munitions plant in Dusseldorf. There was a pocket and we had surrounded it. And there was a lot of fighting, and we finally captured it. The Germans inside surrendered. And I was guarding two prisoners who were sitting in the corner with their hands behind their heads like this. And suddenly there was a counterattack. Now we're surrounded. We've got to fight our way out. My lieutenant came running to me and said, Hi, Miss. Shoot those two. I need you out front. What would you do if you were me? I said, sir, they've surrendered. He said, I know, I don't care. Shoot them, that's an order. I thought about a higher authority, the one I'd prayed to. And I said, sir, I will not. I knew that disobeying an order in combat could cause me to be court-martialed, perhaps with a death penalty. <clears throat> my lieutenant grabbed my little rifle and shot those two and said, come with me. I did, we had a firefight. He said, you're on report, but he didn't live to make that report. He was killed in that battle. I have thought about that over the years. I'm so glad I didn't obey that order. If I had, wouldn't I have been just like the Nazis, only doing that which they were ordered to do? Well, the fight continued clear across uh, Germany. We went from town to town, 
from village to village. Our machine gun was used to support the ground troops as the fighting went on. Uh, it was hard to shoot that machine gun without a partner and without the tripod, which was... Eventually, I found another machine gun group had lost some of their men. We put, put ourselves together to make one group and we fought our way through the Black Forest. We were assigned to General Patton's Third Army, the 97th Infantry Division, 303rd Infantry Regiment, Company H, Heavy Weapons, assigned to General Patton's Third Army. So I got to ride on the tanks, and we were going through the Black Forest, and the Germans would put a roadblock up in front, and the tanks would use their guns to blow the roadblock apart so we could move forward. My job was to look all around to make sure there was no rocket launcher or Germans prepared to shoot the rocket launcher to try and blow the tracks off of the, off of the track. We were going along and the tank commander had the hatch open and we came to a roadblock and sure enough in a I saw this rocket launcher come up, aimed at our tank. I slapped the commander on his shoulder and pointed, and he brought the gun around and fired. The concussion was so strong, and we were so close, that I was nearly blown off the tank. I jumped down and with him, and we walked over, and there were two headless German soldiers and an arm lying over, and this sergeant pulled the ring off of the finger, stuck in his pocket. He said, thanks, Hymas, they nearly got us. I remember that well. We were going through a village and there was a sniper up ahead. I couldn't see the building he was in. The uh, riflemen couldn't show themselves and they were calling for support. And I asked them if they could tell me where the tracers were going, I'd provide support. And I did. I was shooting over their heads into a house. Something inside said, lie low. I thought, of course, I heard a voice, but I didn't see anybody. Lie low. And I did. I flopped flat on the ground behind the machine gun. And a sniper bullet smacked into the wall right where I had been. And the rifleman saw where that sniper had fired from and we took him out. Very close call for me. Can you go back to something here about, um, was it Jimmy as your friend, your assistant machine gunner? Yes, he when, was. Um, you f that was your first day of combat. Was that when he got killed? In the first 20 minutes of that fight, yes. Had you... Uh, in the time you had been together, um, you must have talked about families and friends and back home and dreams. And it was about three and a half months we were together. Do you remember like sitting up there that first day to facing something that you had never envisioned facing, both of you? Did, did, did you talk about your thoughts about what was going on and what was anticipated in your What's ahead of us? We didn't know. We looked across the waters of that river to that hillside. It was always quiet. We knew the enemy was there. We knew we had a few Americans across. We knew that we would be called upon to support the riflemen with covering fire. And we had trained to do that. We knew how to do that. Did you? Uh... We would shake hands and say, I'll take care of you and you take care of me. So you talked about life and death and the possibility that... Yeah, he was a good Catholic. Was he worried? Yes, he was. But he was a tough kid. He grew up in the streets. He'd been in fights like I never had. I grew up on a farm. I'd never, never even heard many swear words. And we were just as different as we could be. He had bright, black, flashing eyes dark hair, swarthy complexion. Before my hair turned gray, I was blonde, blue-eyed. 
We made an interesting pair, but we loved each other. That must have been a, a sort of interesting situation because um, 60 years ago, him being a Roman Catholic and you being a Mormon, that both your institutions, the, the, things were, he were a lot less understanding, especially the Catholic Church, that they, they would have, he, in his upbringing, he probably would have assumed you were... We had differences. He went to his Catholic Mass and I went to my meeting. He had his scriptures and I had mine and we sometimes talked about those things. But the overriding higher objective of being a good soldier and winning the war overcame all those differences. So personally, too, you must have, uh, it sounds like your experience you, that you talked to up until the point of combat, that, uh, that World War II in your training and your moving around, that you learned a lot about people in yourself. I tried. I tried. I really tried. I learned as much as they could teach me, but they can never teach you what you need to know when the bullets are coming and the shells are exploding and the wounded and the dying are crying. You can never prepare for that. It comes as such a shock to your system, to your nerves, to your very being, to your memory even. What I remember about that explosion that killed my friend is that his body was blown to bits. That must be awful hard. I mean, one minute he's there, one minute he's gone. He felt no pain. I'm sure of that. And the tripod he was carrying over his shoulders with the cradle that the machine gun sits in was blown to bits. Did you, um, did you pause? Were you so busy that you there kept was on... No, there was no time to pause. I didn't even look back. There was no time. The shells were coming thick and fast. They were, I kept as close to the ground as I could. I carried that one part of the firing mechanism I couldn't make it fire unless I could stand up, and I didn't dare stand up. <clears throat> that was probably the your, the day you really understood what was happening. Yes, and, and by the time we'd gotten to Dusseldorf, I felt like I... I was a pretty good soldier. I knew there were enemy out there. I knew they were there to kill us, and we had to kill them first. And uh, on, I, rem I know now that it was a Wednesday. I know that it was April the, I think, 5th. It was overcast. It had been raining. We were on a hill. We were preparing to attack the town of Weimar. We fought from village to village. This is in East Germany. We've come a long ways. My machine gun squad has lost a lot of men. There are only four of us left of the 16. And as the officers look down, their glasses getting ready for the attack, through the trees in a kind of a forest glade on to the side, there's barbed wire. They said, that might be a prisoner of war camp. Maybe our friends are there. You four machine gun guys, check it out. If we hear any shooting, we'll turn and support you. So we went sneaking down through these bushes and trees, very stealthy. It was quite a ways. It must have been about uh, 10 o'clock in the morning, perhaps, 9.30, I'm not sure. When we got to this wire enclosure, it was huge. It was 12 or more feet high. The wires were in white insulators. I knew that they were electrified and we mustn't touch them. Behind the wires, there were large brown barn-like buildings. There was nobody around that I could see. 
On one side, I could see a brick building with a tall chimney, and there was a strange smell in the air. I'd never smelled anything like it before. I couldn't place it. Uh, I could see a, a guard tower, but there was no one in it. Well, we were supposed to check it out, and we had a Bangalore torpedo. That's a tube about two inches in diameter and about six feet long filled with explosives. You can screw two of them together, and their purpose is to slip under barbed wire entanglements. And when you set off the explosive, the sharp metal shards cut the wire, and then you have an opening to go through. And we did that. And when the explosion went off, a group of SS officers, and I want to be very clear, I know their uniform. They were indeed SS officers, came running and firing. One of my companions was wounded, but we captured or killed 12 or 14. I'm not sure how many. This was Buchenwald concentration camp. We had no idea what kind of a place it was. I know now that all the people, the prisoners, were huddled inside because the rumor was going around that these officers were going to blow up the camp to destroy all the evidence before the Americans came. Many of the prisoners had been marched off into the woods on some God-forsaken trek where many of them died or were shot. We ran to each of these buildings and opened the door to see if there were guards in there. No guard would go in there. I cannot tell you the stench and the smell and the horrors we saw. Hundreds of skeleton people. That's what they looked like. With only a, a bucket in the corner, living in their own filth. There were no guards any place. One little starving face from the lowest rack wrapped his arms around my, my legs, and I looked up, and another starving face, sunken cheeks, looked like a skull. A little voice said, Americanish? Yes, yes, we're Americans. You can come out. You're free. They didn't fully understand. There were hundreds of naked, rotting bodies stacked around the crematorium, like cordwood, the lowest row stacked east and west, the next row north and south, the next row east and west, rotting, awful, the stench. I have seen the autopsy room, where those horrible experiments were done. There were jars of human body parts on shelves around the wall. On the table, there was something I'd never seen before. I couldn't identify it. Then it dawned on me. Tattooed skins stripped from prisoners. I'd never seen such horrors. When the shooting started, our, our own unit came to support us. But what could four men do for all those prisoners? What could 20 men do? What could 350 men do? What could 1,000 men do? We couldn't help them. We couldn't do anything for them. The orders came that we were to touch nothing except help those who were still alive, if we could. Our own doctors and nurses came. The only positive memory I have of that experience is the nurses and the doctors washing and cleansing these poor prisoners, wrapping them in blankets, trying to keep them warm, hoping to feed them. We were ordered to go into Weimar and march all the civilians out to see what had happened. And we did it at the point of a gun or a bayonet. They went with their hands behind their heads saying, Me nix Nazi, me nix Nazi. 
when we got them all out there, we made them pick up and carry all of these dead, rotting bodies to place them, to dump them into a large burial pit that the engineers had dug. There was an inspection team that came from Allied High Command and from our own Congress. General Eisenhower came, General Bradley came, General Patton came. We called him Blood and Guts. General Patton threw up when he saw what we had found. Most of the evidence that was used in the Nuremberg war crime trials after the war was gathered at that time at Buchenwald concentration camp just outside of Weimar. I was there, I would say, four or five days. And then I was ordered forward to the front line where my main unit was. We continued to the there wasn't really much fighting. There were a lot of prisoners taken. We made it to the Czech border, and the orders were that we were just hold there. And Patton really wanted to capture Prague, but it was reserved from some agreement made with the Russians that they would do that. However, he prevailed on General Eisenhower, who prevailed on, by that time, President Truman. We got the go ahead. I was with a small group of reconnaissance who moved swiftly into Prague, Czechoslovakia. And we were going through the city. The riflemen were clearing all of the buildings ahead to make sure they were clear. My new partner named Arvizu and I had our machine guns set up to cover all the roads in the intersection. And out of the corner of my eye, I saw a German soldier run across the street, just to, it was kind of up a little hill. He ran across the street into a house. And I said to Arvizu, let's go capture that German. He said, okay, not too smart. We said, watch our, watch our machine gun. We had pistols, 45 automatics. So we kind of sneaked up the street. The house was set back from the street, and there was a wall around it about this high, and we were behind the wall so anyone in the house couldn't see us. Arvizu went around to the back, and he could make a sound like a bird, and I waited for his signal, and then he burst into the back, and I went through the front. The doors were kind of like uh, paneled uh, French doors. I had, well, I'll tell you how I was dressed. I had my steel helmet with some toilet tissue tucked in the liner. I had a pair of wool pants, a wool shirt, a field jacket, combat boots with a spoon tucked in the side. I had a pistol belt with a pistol, a trench knife, cartridges, canteen, first aid kit, a couple of hand grenades. I had gloves, of course. I think I broke some of the panels as we went in because the procedure we'd been taught was to shoot the first thing that moves and that will stop movement. And the surprise was genuine. There were more than one persons in that house. We ran them all out, some women, some men. They were all in uniform. They were in the process of changing into civilian clothes to fade into civilian life before we got there. We lined them all up, disarmed them. The one in charge seemed to be a SS colonel. I know their uniforms, the death's head on his cap and the lightning strikes on his collar. And as I disarmed him, I felt some, a bulge inside of his tunic. And I pulled it out, and it was an American-made Smith & Wesson semi-automatic. When I racked the slide, it had Remington rounds in it. I knew where he got that, from an American, possibly a pilot. I became so angry. 
I pushed my pistol up his nose, and I pulled the hammer back, and I came within that much of pulling the trigger. And then I remembered a higher authority. He's my prisoner. He said to me in perfect English, American uniforms are not pretty. Well, of course they were not. I'd lived in that for five months, covered with mud and blood and torn in places. He was my prisoner. There were 91 in that house. Two of us captured them all. We had a box full of guns and weapons. And he was very angry to realize that a private first class had taken him prisoner. There were other Americans came about that time and they were calling for us to move ahead. So we turned them all over to some advanced uh, uh, artillery personnel and left and moved forward. We were pulled back to Pilsen, Czechoslovakia. And we heard that the war would soon be ending, maybe even tomorrow. We were very tired. My whole unit was trying to get some sleep, and I was on guard. It seemed like I was always on guard, standing guard to make sure nobody bothered the ones when it was quiet. And it was quiet this night. There was no shooting. There was no fighting. Our unit was sleeping, and Johnny Short and I were guarding a little road junction just outside of the town of Starry Pilsenets, which it means the old Pilsen, a little town. It was very, very dark. We were talking softly, and I heard footsteps coming. And I said, shh, quiet. We don't know who they are. Could be American. Could be Russians. We're that close to the Russian line. Could be Germans. All of a sudden... Johnny jumped up, pulled out his pistol, bang, 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 and they shot back a few shots. All of a sudden, things are quiet. Johnny's out of ammunition. What do we do? He said, I'll go back and alert the troops. So on his tummy, he went crawling back. I'm there alone. I don't know what's out there. I know some bullets came at us, but missed. I'm flat on my stomach. I can hear breathing. If the moon would come out or if I could have a little light, I don't dare tear, turn on my flashlight. That would give my position away. I can hear deep, heavy breathing. Maybe someone has been wounded. I thought if I could get just a little bit closer, perhaps I could see who it was. I got my pistol up ready. I pulled the hammer back and it clicked. And the voice said, Comrade Nick Sheetson. It was a German soldier. I turned the flashlight on. Ah, oh, Americanish. Hans, come and see here, Americanish. There were two of them trying to find the American lines to surrender to. What do you do with two soldiers that you capture the night before the war in Europe ended? I didn't know. So I locked them in a chicken coop. I hope they're still there. The war ended shortly after that. We went into the big city of, of Prague. I was riding in the Jeep. We set up our machine gun to cover the second largest Jewish synagogue in Europe. It's located on the main street. It's called the Great Synagogue. It had been taken over and desecrated by the SS and by the Gestapo. And we covered all the exits while the riflemen went in, a little bit of shooting, few grenades, and they brought out 40 prisoners. And then the war finally did end. These men were still fighting after the surrender was signed. We had to clean out the cathedral tower. There were snipers in the top of the tower, and we did that. And the, it was so different because the German civilians were sullen and hated us. The Czech civilians were Wonderful. They loved us and tried to help. I didn't get to stay very long there. My unit was ordered back to across Germany, back to France, to another tent camp called Old Gold, also another popular cigarette. And we waited there for a ship. I'm going to go home. I could hardly wait. 
They load us on a cruise <coughs> ship. There's lights all over the place. There's movies, ice cream and cake, steak dinners. Oh, I wanted to see my homeland so much. They said we would soon be able to see the Statue of Liberty. And I went up to the bow of the ship and I watched all day. I didn't see a thing. I made my bed up there and I slept there all night. The next morning I began watching. I watched again all day. Just as the sun was going down and the sky was all red, I made out that tiny little figure of the Statue of Liberty on my homeland. I'm coming home. I'll never forget that welcome. There were tugboats and fireboats and blimps and dancing girls and my mother cut out the picture in our hometown paper of the 97th Division coming home on that ship. Got on the train, arrived in Salt Lake City with my friend Ken Weiser. Ken was in my division, but he was in a rifle regiment, so I only got to see him just once in a while. But we arrived home on the train together. I called my mom. It's 120 miles from Salt Lake to my home. She answered the phone and she said, Dad's out in the field working. Stick up your thumb. We'll see you when you get here. I was somewhat disappointed they didn't come and get me. But I've forgiven her. We did stick up our thumb. Everybody gave people rides. We got home. I had a short 10-day leave. I went down to the field, the sugar bait field that my father had. And guess what? There were German prisoners of war working in that field. Well, they weren't working. They were sitting over in the shade of a tree drinking cool water. When they saw me coming in my uniform, they jumped up and I said, Achtung, attention, and they stood right at attention. I said, Arbeiten Sie, get to work. Mach schnell, do it quick. And all I saw was rear ends going down the beat row, pulling the weeds and doing the things they were supposed to be doing. I wasn't home very long. They ordered me back to Fort Lewis, Washington. However, no, that's wrong. They sent me to Fort Bragg, North Carolina to take some training to assault ant beaches or be an amphibious assault force. But when we got there, the orders were changed. They put us on a train to Fort Lewis, Washington. As we traveled across country, I remember the train had a big delay in Minneapolis and all the servicemen spread out, going to the stores, buying food, talking to the girls and the civilians. And when the train said toot toot, they all came running as fast as they could because the train is pulling out. I was on the very last car and a young man soldier was running as fast as he could with a watermelon under one arm and a case of beer on the other. And we were trying to help him. All of them were trying to get the beer aboard. And just as they were successful in doing that, he stumbled and fell. I remember seeing that soldier sitting in the middle of the tracks with a broken watermelon and his beer on the train. We arrived at Fort Lewis. I got one pass to come to Tacoma, went to a movie, and then, now the war had not ended in Japan, and then we boarded a ship, a, a troop ship, to go to invade Japan. I remember the band was playing Sentimental Journey as we went up the gangway. This time, we were combat veterans loaded on a troop ship. And the Navy was operating a ship, but they had one small squad of Marines who had just gotten out of basic training and they were supposed to be the guards to make sure the army personnel didn't go into officer's country. And on the deck, one of our soldiers was sitting up on a lifeboat, I think, and he was reading. And for some reason, one of the Marines, we called them white sidewalls because of their haircuts, said to this soldier, get down from there. The soldier was writing or reading a book, I can't remember which, and he looked down at the Marine and said, make me. So the Marine pulled a gun on him, on the soldier. But before he could 
make a move, he was hanging over the side by his feet. And all the soldiers were shouting and yelling, let him go, let him go. He was outnumbered thousands to one. The lieutenant of the Marines came running out, ordered all the rest of the squad out with fixed bayonets to quell what he thought was a riot. They were disarmed in minutes. The Marine got spit in the face. The Navy captain came on the horn and ordered everybody to their bunks to lie at attention, two in each bunk. And we did that, and that's how they solved the problem. We had our own guards to, to make uh, officer country free from enlisted men. The Marines were not allowed on the deck the rest of that, ship, that voyage. About six days out, we heard on the radio that the uh, atom bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. Why Hiroshima? Because it was a military target. There were 40,000 Japanese Army regulars waiting for us to come. These, this was the army that invaded China and committed the atrocities against the civilians that we now refer to as the Rape of Nanking. I would have had to fight those soldiers, but that army was wiped out. But as is, in true, as is true in all war time, many civilians suffered as a result. And then the bomb was dropped on Nagasaki. Why Nagasaki? Because it was a military target. It was the largest munitions plant in the world in those days, making guns and bombs and tanks and airplanes. Mitsubishi, we know the name now. That munitions plant was destroyed and the Japanese surrendered. But our ship didn't return. We sailed on to the Philippines and dropped anchor. And then I have learned since there was some kind of a discussion about who would occupy the Philippines or Japan. And our division commander, whose name was General Halsey, the same as the Admiral, he had two stars and he pulled rank and he wanted to go to Japan. So we didn't get off the ship. We sailed on to Japan for a total voyage of 31 days from Tacoma to Cebu, Philippines, to Japan, where we disembarked at Yokohama. And I was assigned as a military policeman. And our, our uh, assignments were to search out anything that could be used as a weapon against us. All of the weapons must be turned in to the Japanese police, who in turn were under the control of General Douglas MacArthur and the United States Army, and those of us who were military police. And I, I was stationed in Yokohama, in Sendai, in Kofu, which is near Mount Fujiyama, and in Niigata, which is a seaport on the West China Sea. And uh, while I was in Niigata, I had a very interesting assignment. My job was to go to a warehouse where all of these arms had been turned in by the Japanese to their police and they were stashed in this warehouse. It was filled with hunting rifles and shotguns and samurai swords and hairy carry knives and daggers and uh, ceremonial swords. And there were five Japanese civilians who were paid by the U.S. Army and my job was to bring them to the warehouse. I had a girl interpreter, lock them in, and they were to destroy these weapons. And they would sit crouched down and take one samurai sword and cut the trappings and the handle off of the other one. And all the metals were placed in a box to be melted down. And all the wood and cords and finished work that would burn would be burned. And they sat there with tears running down their face while we destroyed what I now understand to be much of their heritage, their culture. We were allowed to send home one box of souvenirs. And it was one, one way the army was able to get rid of 
military weapons and weapons of, of war. That box could not exceed 48 inches. It was a wooden box. I was able to send three boxes, one per, per month, one each month home, including kimonos and silk, which my wife later made her med wedding dress from, and a white horse hide and a, a pistol and some samurai swords and some daggers and souvenirs. And that's, that's how the army disarmed Japan. I went on a jeep patrol with a lieutenant, a jeep driver, and a Japanese interpreter. We called him Nisai. He was born in the United States but spoke fluent Japanese. And we went clear up to the town of Shibata looking for weapons, and it had been reported there were some there. I was the guard. And when we arrived, we were there most of the night, so we, we took over at a geisha house to find a place to sleep and I had a small revolver tucked into my, in a shoulder holster inside my, my shirt, which I always slept with. I had my rifle and I had my pistol. It was nearby. In the middle of the night, there was a great, terrible, crashing noise. And it was necessary, I thought, to shoot who was coming. It turned out to be a North Korean who had come to the town there were about three or four of them. They got stinking drunk on sake. They had a, a girl they were dragging by the hair who they'd tortured and she was unconscious. He learned that we were there. He thought that he was an ally. The Koreans were an ally against the Japanese. And after beating up the girl and getting drunk, they came over to be friendly, but I thought they were attacking. We called the police. They hauled the the drunk Koreans off to the pokey and we took the girl to first aid center to be treated. And uh, it, that was an incident in occupation that, that caused a certain amount of uh, excitement. When I was in Niigata, it was in the winter time, there was a lot of snow on the ground. We were, we were based in a, a school building. Each of the school rooms had several of us with bunks and a coal heater to keep warm and we stood guard and we did occupational duties and military police duties and when we had a little time off we went to a movie and they had hot communal baths and one of them was taken over by the army so that the army personnel could use them and we had done that and gone to the movie and three of us were walking back in a snowstorm to our to our barracks and uh, I was speaking to the man next to me. I don't remember his name. I didn't know him well. He was from Texas, and his father owned a ranch, and he was quite wealthy. He hadn't been in combat. He'd been a replacement and come to our unit to Japan. And as I started to say something to him, he was not there. And I looked. I couldn't find him. We looked all over. It was snowing heavily. It was a blizzard. What happened to him? We hurried on to the to the officer of the day in our deck or in our uh, regiment office and told him about it. We've got a search. Here yeah, we're back in business. I want to go back to Europe here just for a second. I only had a chance to, you know, you were talking about what you wore and we heard a lot of people talk about what they wore and what it was like sleeping in the cold and the snow but um, you talked about uh, I want to explain about the spoon in the boot and the toilet paper in the helmet why why that well helmets a really good thing it protects your head from bullets and falling debris you can dig a foxhole with it you can wash your clothes in it. It works like a latrine. You need the toilet paper. You always carried that. The spoon in my boot was so that I could eat the things I found along the way, or sometimes they would say to us, here's a K ration, share it between two of you. The, the soup kitchen will be up 
from tomorrow afternoon. We never saw him for five days. I got so hungry. In a cellar that we were fighting our way through, I found a small bottle of white cherries and a crust of black bread. I was so hungry. I cut the mold off the bread and wolfed it down and I ate all those cherries. Can you imagine what that did? Stomach ache, diarrhea. It's awful hard to fight a war when those things are happening to you. Did you, uh, when you were moving through uh, Europe after crossing the Rhine, were you always out front? Were you? Were you advanced? We were always on the front line. In fact, with Patton, you were always ahead of the front line. He was a tough, tough general. But I admired him, I honored him, and we followed the orders that our company was given. I recall that one time in Europe and eastern Germany, we got so far ahead, they asked us to hold it. And so we were stopped at a farmhouse compound, and there was a large uh, mobile artillery piece that was by the side of the barn. The barn and the house and the chicken coop and the storage sheds were all in a kind of a compound so that the heat of the animals could keep the, the, the family warm. There was a German farmer and his wife and they had a slave laborer, a woman named, I, she was from Poland, she was Polish and I think her name was Tonya. Anyway, we set up our machine gun, camouflage it, and we two of us had to sit by the machine gun and look ahead toward the front every minute. So we took turns, two hours on and four hours off. And uh, we cooked what food we could get, and occasionally there'd be a, a jeep bring us some cartridges, and, and uh, we were to keep quiet, keep low, and not do anything. And we did that, I think we were there for about 10 days. I recall one day hearing a terrible noise. I thought it was an awful noise. And it was in the upper level of the barn. And I climbed up the ladder to see what was going on and there was a, the farmer was up there. He was a big fat guy. He was sitting in a chair and they had a big hopper with a great wheel on it with a handle. And this slave labor girl was being forced to turn the handle while they ground some kind of grain to make chicken feed out of it. I'm a farmer, I knew what they were doing. And uh, every time she bent over, he had a pitchfork, he would whack her with the handle of the pitchfork on her back to make her keep going. And she was crying, but she was doing it. That made me very angry. I made him turn the wheel. And every time he bent over, I pricked him with the pitchfork a, a little bit to make him go. Well, she loved it. She became my friend. And she was afraid of him after that for what had happened. And she asked if she could sleep in the area where we were so we could protect her. So we gave her a corner and she slept to, on some blankets that she had. We were in the other corner. Now to fraternize with a civilian was a, a, could be a fine of $65. That's more than three months pay. I never fraternized with any of the civilians, but I thought, well, she's Polish. And I did befriend her a little bit. One day she came with something in her apron she wanted to give me, fresh eggs. I hadn't eaten fresh eggs for months. Oh, that tasted good. But the orders came soon that we were to move ahead and we did so. And I don't ever know what ever happened to her. Mm -hmm. Did, um, did what was your view of the Germans at that time? Did you uh, were did you have hatred, or were they did you identify each individual as an enemy, or were you fighting a country, or what were you? <clears throat> well, I had two feelings. The first one was, there's an enemy. What is it? It's just a big mass. Then, when my friend is killed, it's a wicked, fearful fighting mass of people. Then when we captured a couple, gosh, these are kids like me. 
those two that were shot, one was younger than me. He was even crying. But then, after Buchenwald, I hated them. I didn't care if they suffered. I wanted them to. I wanted them to share the horrors that they'd perpetrated on these helpless people. So the people that you went into the town and brought back to Buchenwald, the German citizens, your, your attitude? We prodded them. Yeah. Now, I, never, I never killed defenseless people. Some of our men did that because they were German. And sometimes it was a mistake. You didn't know. But I always followed the rule. I can remember General Patton said, your role in this war is not to die like some poor bastard. It's to make the other poor bastard die. And I worked at being a good soldier. Did the, uh, when they brought the Germans back to the camp, were, um, now what town was this? That you... The town is Weimar. And that was right at Buchenwald? Weimar is, was noted historically, I didn't know it then, but I know it now, because of its cultural heritage. And this is just the opposite, the far reaches of wickedness. What was the civilians' reactions when you marched them in the booth? Me, Nix Nazi, we didn't do it. So they we had didn't known. know. Goodness, you could smell the death in the town, in the valley, all over. Mm. Do you have a. Do you, do you dream about this still? When I first came home, I had horrible nightmares. About six or seven years ago, the Holocaust Center asked if I would tell my story. And I said, I can't do that. And they coaxed. And I said, well, I'll try. And I've done that now for the last seven years, many times. It became a healing process for me to talk about it because I never could. When the war was over, my parents wanted me to, let's get on with life. Let's not think about those terrible things. How could you not? They're branded in my brain. So when you first got there and you lost your friend Jimmy and the things you must have seen terrible and human things even before Buchenwald. Oh yes, yeah. And I, I saw the things that happened in war as we fought each other and as my friends and fellow soldiers died and were wounded and were tended by the medics and helped in tight places, that was nothing like the imprisonment, the torture, the starvation, the mistreatment, and the cruelty that was done to the people. Uh, I can still see in my mind's eye that SS officer with that naked, rotting body over his shoulder and his handkerchief to his nose as he carried him to dump him into this huge, big pit. SS officer, I made him do it. I have seen the warehouse where all the personal effects were stacked. The purses, the glasses, the crutches, the rings, the coats, the underwear, the shoes, the socks, thousands of people's personal belongings. I didn't know it then, but I know now there were more than 18,000 prisoners in that camp. I didn't know it then, but I know now that they brought prisoners of war from the Russian front to be executed at Buchenwald, and they did it in a very weird way. They took two at a time in a van to a stable that had been converted to look like a doctor's clinic office. They told the prisoners to take off their clothes, go stand on the scale. They were to be given a physical behind the wall with a little slot in the wall. Two SS officers shot them in the neck and their bodies were dragged 
over and dump down a coal chute to a basement room. And there were hooks on the room. They're still there. If the body was not yet dead, he was hung on the hook to be strangled with wire by SS officers. And then they were placed on a lift like an elevator and pushed up to the crematorium for the bodies to be burned. When I was there in 1945, the crematorium couldn't take care of the countless bodies. They did away with 9,000 Russian prisoners of war in Buchenwald in that strange manner. Mm. In yeah, um, that first night after you breached the wire, did you sleep? No. No. I stood guard. I tried to talk to some of the prisoners. None of them, we couldn't understand each other. We couldn't let them wander away. Most of them could hardly walk. We made them stay in the tent. I mean in the camp. We tried to bring things to them. I, I tried to share my food with them. Made them sick. They couldn't eat it. I don't think I slept those four or five days at all. Just snatches here and there. So what was the feeling you had? Were you sick to your stomach? or you? I didn't throw up. I didn't get seasick, and I didn't throw up at Buchenwald. But I had a hard time eating anything. Do you remember the smell? I've never smelled it before and I never have since. But I'll tell you what I thought it smelled like. I lived on a farm and sometimes our cattle would die. And there was a processing plant that would pick up dead cattle, dead horses, dead dogs, whatever. And they processed them into what they called fox food. And it was sold to those who raised foxes or mink for fur. And I had gone with my father on occasion to that place. And the smell emanating from that processing plant was, I thought, similar to the smell of the burning flesh in the crematoriums. And the, filth, the smell of the filth, the rotting bodies, the fluids and the... Uh... Had you known before you got to Buchenwald, had you heard rumors about... We, we knew absolutely nothing. Absolutely nothing. We thought it was a prisoner of war camp. We hoped there would be friends of ours in there. Speaking of a prisoner of war camp, I was sent on a mission with a jeep driver back to rear, rear echelon. And on the way, on the Audubon, we were back behind lines. There was a, a soldier sitting on a bag. He was in a English uniform, and we stopped, and he had been a prisoner of war of the Germans for four and a half years, and he had been freed, and he was trying to walk to the airport where he thought he could get a ride home. I picked him up like a child. He'd had a blister on his foot, and it had gangrene, and his leg was swelled up to here, and it was... It was very, very bad. He couldn't even walk on it. I picked him up and lifted him into the back of the Jeep. And I asked him how much he thought he weighed. He said, four stone. I don't know what four stone is, but I've had it translated to be about 60 pounds. Mm -hmm. We drove him. We took a side trip from our mission to the airport. I don't know which airport it was, but there was a B-17 bomber carrying prisoners of war back to England. And I lifted him up and placed him, on, placed him on a stretcher and he was carried aboard the plane. And I shook his hand and he said, I'll be home tonight. And he, I'm sure he was. I don't know his name. I don't know where he lived. Mm. But he had been a prisoner of war. So when we talked about bar barbed wire or saw that barbed wire, I thought that's what we were talking about. Some place where some of our friends might be. I had no idea it was a concentration camp. Now, one of the Holocaust survivors has challenged me a little bit. He said, you must not speak of it as a death camp. And I said, 
Henry, there was so much death there. It was a death camp. 52,000 men, women, and children died in that camp between the time it opened in 1929 until we closed it in April of 1945. And they died there from starvation, from beatings, from torture, from overwork, from shootings, from hangings, and for no other reason than they were born Jewish. The youngest prisoner was little Hannah, six years old. What would she be doing in a place like that? Mm -hmm. She's Jewish. She'll grow up and raise more Jews. Now I've met only four survivors of that camp. One of them lives in Vancouver, BC. I was traveling up there, went to the Jewish Center. They said, oh, you're a liberator of Buchenwald. Yes. We have a survivor. We'll call him on the phone. He said, don't let that man live. I'm come, leave. I'm coming right down. How do you think I felt waiting for the door to open? What would he look like? What would he say? What would I say to him? I don't have to tell you it was a very emotional meeting. His name is Robbie Weissman. He was taken in a small town in Poland. I don't even know the name. He lived with his mom, his younger sister, and his younger brother, and his dad. They're Jewish. His dad had a store. His mother was a school teacher. When the Germans came, the store was confiscated. Jews can't teach. Mother couldn't teach. Robbie couldn't go to school. What could they do? When the food ran out, they couldn't go out to buy. They couldn't do anything. If any friend came and dropped some food on the, on the uh, doorstep, that would be subject to terrible penalties, maybe even death. Father said, I know. I'll get on a train, the last one out of town. I'll stay in the shadows, buy a ticket, go on the train out into the country, and I'll buy some food from a farmer and bring back to feed you. And he did that. Got on the train. They know now. SS officers came through. He had no star on his coat. He had no papers. Jews aren't allowed to travel. They jerked his pants down to see if he was circumcised. He was. He's a Jew. They never saw him again. Mm -hmm. He was taken to a concentration camp. So they're waiting for Father to come back. He doesn't come. The Germans are loading all the Jews in the trucks, taking them to the train and shipping to the camps. Mother says, I won't go. This is my home. I live here. They can't do this. But they did. Two soldiers came, knocked down the door. They had a little dog. He ran to bark at the intruders with a rifle. They killed the dog. The little toddler brother ran over to see the dog. Another rifle butt. The little brother's dead. They went upstairs. Grandma's in her bed. They shoot her in her bed. They drag grandfather downstairs. Mother holding the little girl and Robbie and grandmother. Grandfather are dragged out and loaded in a truck and put in a cattle car. Ninety or a hundred of them. They can't even sit down. Robbie looks through a little crack. He can see it's daytime, then it's night. Eight days they're locked in that boxcar as the train travels to Auschwitz. When they arrive, grandfather has died. Mother can't work. She's holding the little girl. Go that way. She's on her way to the guest chamber. That's the last Robbie saw of his mother. It looked like he could work. They stripped all his clothes off, shaved him, tattooed his arm, put him in the camp to work. An older prisoner named Daniel gave him a bowl so he'd have something to eat. If you don't have a bowl, you get nothing to eat. They fed him a piece of black bread the size of his thumb half a cup of turnip soup every 24 hours and worked them 16 hours a day. As the Russians came closer and closer, suddenly they took 3,000 of the prisoners. Daniel had died by this time and began marching them west. They arrived at Buchenwald. 
of the 3,000, only 300 survived that death march in the winter. If anybody fell out, they were shot and left for the farmers to bury. Robbie was one of those who survived. They threw him in the little camp where they kept the children because they expected him to die that night. He lived three and a half months till we came. I'm going to see him. I don't know the story that he's going to tell me. When the war was over, I got to come home to my family, to my father, my mother, my brother, my sister, my dog and my pony, and my home. When the war was over, Robbie had nothing. Nothing. He came as an orphan on a ship with a group of orphans to New York. We wouldn't let him land because they might take our jobs but Canada took him in, and he, he grew up in a foster home. He was 14 years old when we came. All he had was a little piece of paper that said he was a prisoner at Buchenwald. I looked at it, and I did a double take. He was born on my birthday, the 2nd of February. I was just barely 19 and he was just barely 14. That day he was liberated. He's my friend now. We exchange greetings on our birthday. He has a beautiful wife and a lovely family, but no relatives. What do you think about the Germans today? I've been back four times. I had an experience the last time with my Czech friends we were in Czechoslovakia, in the town of Heb, spelled C-H-E-B. We went into a small restaurant. There were two people my age, a man and his wife, sitting at a table just across from us. I sat down with my friend Jerry and John Katerzabek. She speaks Russian, German, Czech, and English. And she nudged me and said, they are German tourists here on holiday. I looked at the German, and he gave me a strange stare. I smiled. He called the waitress over and said something to her, and they got up and left, leaving their plates half finished. Jerry said uh, he told the waitress he would not eat in the same restaurant as an American. Mm. I was giving a presentation to a group of University of Washington students telling them this story. When I finished, a young man came with tears in his eyes. He said, Mr. Hymas, I am German. What can I do to comfort him? I said, friends, I know a survivor that would tell you that you need feel no guilt. You were not even born. I guess he felt a little better. He sent me his wedding announcement. And then he went back to Germany. He was getting a master's degree at the University of Washington. Yeah, that doesn't quite answer my question. <laughs> I don't have any because, hatred for the German people. But the war criminals deserved to be yeah. hated for the wickedness and the atrocities and the criminal intent that they had. It's sort of complicated who's who's who though, who is guilt, who had guilt, who doesn't have guilt, who. I followed uh, the camp commander. His name was Koch, K-O-C-H-E. His wife, Ilse Koch, was the one who liked the tattoos and collected them. Mm. She was arrested and put on trial. And she decided he had committed suicide. And she decided that the Americans would have mercy on her if she were pregnant. So somehow she got herself pregnant. She was sentenced to life imprisonment and she later died in prison. So 
So when you went to Japan and you were, um, because you're very, there's, we've only talked to a couple people that have been in both theaters. There are only two divisions that were, and yeah. mine was one of them. And well, I told you, I, we lost this man, we hunted for him in the snow, and we found his body with a knife in his back the next day. Hmm. When uh, my division was deactivated in Japan in 1946, I came home, sailed back into Seattle, traveled back to my home in Utah, met my family. I again was with my friend Ken Weiser. Found my childhood sweetheart. I'd met her in the sixth grade. I went on a mission for the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints to the Northwest, North Central Mission, which was in Minneapolis in South Dakota. Came home, married my sweetheart, went to college, graduated in business administration, and worked in the aerospace industry. I have four children, 16 grandchildren, and five great-grandchildren. Mm -hmm. I worked for Martin, I worked for Convair, I worked for Con Thiokol, building rockets. I've met all seven of the original astronauts because we built the rockets they flew on in their Mercury project. And I retired from the commercial airplane division here in Seattle. I worked in Renton. I lived in Issaquah for about 30 years. And last four years, I moved to Whidbey Island, where my home is now. Did you, uh, you must have met uh, some of the German scientists in the program. Did you meet von Braun himself? I know of them, but I didn't, didn't ever, ever communicate with them. I did have a an engineer that worked with me, his name was Werner Jagatka. And Werner fought on the other side and was captured by the Russians and put in a prison camp. When the war ended, he made his way across into Sweden and somehow made it to Canada, made it to Chicago, married an American lady, became an American citizen, graduated with an engineering degree, and was work, worked with me in our same, same small group at Boeing. He would never discuss it with me. I liked him. I worked with him. I went to his funeral. He was a good American. But he absolutely refused to discuss anything about World War II. At his funeral, I learned more about his service from those who spoke, his friends and his family, and his widow, than he ever told me during the years we worked together. So he was on the Russian front, was he? Yes, he was captured on the Russian front. Mm -hmm. So were you friends? Yes, we were friends. So isn't We went to lunch together quite often. He teased me a lot because he always thought I dressed too nice for the workplace. I said, what? I only wear a tie and a jacket. He said, well, why do you do that? And I said, well, that's what the managers and and that's what the directors and that's what the principals, bosses wear. If you want to be one, you got to look like one. And I was one. So isn't it a little strange to hear someone that uh, there's a hard thing about. Uh, we, we had one interview where the man, his wife passed away. He married a German immigrant. Uh, and he... His father-in-law died, who was a German officer in World War II. He was a German. He was an American B-17 pilot. His wife was a civilian. And here he thought it was so strange that 40-some years later, he was walking in front of the coffin of this ex-German officer. And here he was, had been a B-17 pilot. It's just how, in 40 years, how everything changes. and. Well, when I was in Japan, I was invited by the family of this girl who was my interpreter to their little home. It was a souvenir shop and a hotel and a home combined, and they wanted to ha invited me to a Christmas dinner. Now, when the war was over, they had very little, no souvenirs to sell. Nobody was staying at their hotel. They were very poor. So I went down to the galley, and I grabbed a 
as much spam and butter and whatever I could find to take to this little dinner. And it was held in their home and it was a traditional uh, bamboo f mats and it was cold and they had the kotatsu with the, with the coals and the coverlet that you all sit around for cross-legged and put your hands under. And we had this little dinner and they'd invited a guest and his name was Iwa O Tanaka. And he was a zero pilot just a year older than I. And uh, the home was the home of the Ono family, O-N-O. -O. And the girl who had translated for me was named Terako Ono, and she had two sisters named Setsuko and Mutsuko. And Uncle Sato was there, and Mama-san with Baby-san. And they were all dressed in their beautiful kimonos, and they played the samisen and the koto, and they wanted me to teach them how to do the waltz. Can you imagine a GI in his uniform and stocking feet? My boots were outside. I'm trying to show this beautiful young girl with her hair piled up, her kimono, her obi, how to do the waltz in those little white socks that have the big toe separate from the rest of them. And they had a little wind-up record player and they had a little record, and it was Bing Crosby singing Blue Hawaii, which happens to be a foxtrot. Mm -hmm. Tanaka is my friend. He flew a zero fighter plane. I always thought he was a suicide pilot, a kamikaze, but he wasn't. He flew for the Navy, and he was in the Navy, and he flew to Korea once and back. We have still communicate after all these years. Every Japan holiday, New Year, he sends me a lottery ticket. And I wrote to him and said, Tanaka, if I win, what will be the prize? Oh, it's a toaster or a coffee maker or a mixer. But he has a family. I've been to see him once. I went back to Japan on my way to a work assignment in Jakarta, uh, Indonesia, and I stopped in Japan, and I went to his home in Niigata. No, we went to the Ono Hotel. It's still operated by the same descendants of the same family, and they put on a spread that would make a king blush. Twelve courses. Tanaka and I enjoyed that night together. Mm. Two old enemies, now fast friends. I took with me a, a plaque that I had made. It has a picture of Tanaka in front of the Navy Rising Sun flag with some words about his reunion as a, as a serviceman member. And I took a picture of myself, or had one taken of me, standing beside an American flag behind me. And I put this on a plaque, and I put Iwa O Tanaka, Nipponese Tomodachi, 1945 to Japan, 1945, and then Japan, I think it was in 93 that I went. And then my name is the same. And I had this in a package, and so after we'd eaten, and we were talking, and and then we had an interpreter there. It was a young woman who had come and stayed in my daughter's home as a, an exchange student. She had met me at the airport and, and taken me all around and helped me find Tanaka and helped me find uh, Terako and the ones that I'd known from that time. Well, she was there, and so I brought this plaque out, and I said to Tanaka, our countries were at war many years ago. Now we're at peace, and you are my friend. And I gave him this plaque. Now, Japanese people don't show emotion very much, but tears came down his cheeks, and he gripped my hand in both hands, and Otsuko was crying. It was a very emotional thing. Mm -hmm. Very emotional. We're getting the end of another tape here.
So I think we can probably have hit the end of the conversation. I think I have enough.